Okay, Sharon, if you can hear me, this is all this beautiful music. I think you can pause. Thanks so much, Sharon. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we can share the slides again, Sharon, um, if that's possible. But I'll just get started in the meantime. Um, so good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone, depending on where you are. And thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, a warm welcome to Feminist Leadership Under Construction, which is a collaboration between Akina Mamawa Africa, We Are Feminist Leaders, and Fair Share of Women Leaders, which is where I work. My name is Sophia Sewell, my pronouns are she and her, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this first session today. For those of you who don't know these organizations well yet, we're three organizations that care deeply about feminist leadership, and we really believe it's a crucial tool to build the world that we want to see, starting with our own organizations, initiatives, and movements. So yeah, this is the first of a three-part series taking place over the coming months. And we decided to develop this learning series, uh, Feminist Leadership Under Construction, because we are all hearing from our own and our overlapping communities and audiences that they are keen to spend more time exploring how to operationalize feminist leadership practices and principles in the workplace because maybe we feel like we understand these, um, these ideas in theory or in certain contexts, uh, it's safe to try them out. But unfortunately in many contexts still, um, feminist principles can rub up against corporate models of governance, power structures and systemic oppression. So it's a challenge to, to implement these practices and we're all familiar with that. So what do we do next? So we ran a survey about this, about this learning series to hear exactly what you wanted to learn about and how, and I'm sure that many people here today responded to that survey, so thank you so much. And it was overwhelmingly clear that the topic people wanted to hear about the most was organizational hierarchy. So that's what we're here to talk about today in our first session, hierarchy and feminism like oil and water. Feminist leaders tend to think a lot about hierarchy because we're concerned with more transparent and equitable distribution, or even you could say subversion of power, it can feel quite intuitive to critique hierarchy. I'm sure we're all familiar with um, those critiques. It can and does produce inequity, reproduce inequity, facilitate abuse of power, limit emerging uh, potential for leadership and relegate valuable voices and perspectives to the sidelines. But you know, with everything in life, it's not quite that simple either. Hierarchy can also provide clarity on responsibility, help us know who's accountable for what, and recognize the varying levels of investment or availability for a project. And even if we eradicate organizational hierarchy, how can we ensure that those power dynamics that we're trying to dismantle don't continue to operate under the radar? For some of us, it can be hard to imagine a model of doing feminist work that doesn't involve hierarchy, that doesn't involve this particular organizational structure. So the question we wanna to explore today is, can we sooner imagine the end of the world in organizations without hierarchy? Uh, before we delve into that, and Sharon, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to share, I wanna do a bit of housekeeping and share some principles actually developed by We Are Feminist Leaders for their feminist leadership program um, about how we can create and uphold a safe space, safer space for sharing and learning today. So the first is confidentiality. Um, as you've already seen, we are recording today's session to make it accessible to people who can't be here. If you would like to um, preserve some an anonymity, you can of course change your name and turn off your camera. We won't record breakout rooms. Um, so it's mostly the, the plenary discussion and panel discussion and sharing back at the end. We also have a note taker in the room today, um, Fair Share's new intern, Ava. Uh, but again, she won't be taking notes in breakout rooms. It's just for the panel discussion and the closing at the end. Um, next, we strive to create an environment where everyone listens deeply with curiosity and respect. We encourage everyone to cultivate an awareness of their respective levels of power and privilege and invite you to consider what this means for how you show up in this space today. We won't shy away from difficult or uncomfortable conversations. They're very necessary for our growth. There's the term productive discomfort for a reason. At the same time, some discomfort, of course, stems from marginalization, oppression, discrimination, and we want to support each other to interrupt or intervene in those expressions of power should they occur at any time from any source. Last but not least, um, there are hierarchies and unequal powers, uh, power relations between us as you know, participants, facilitators, guest speakers, but even given that context, we can be equal as thinkers and we wanna treat each other as peers with valuable insights to share. 
Um, a last housekeeping note is that following requests, we've enabled closed captioning. Um, there are some other accessibility requests that unfortunately we weren't able to incorporate into this session. So we do um, apologize for that. Um, and we're gonna look at how we can do so next time. Um, Sharon, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, this is Sharon from Akina Mamua Africa, by the way, <laughs> in case everyone's wondering who I'm talking to. We also have Leila Billing from We Are Feminist uh, Leaders in the room with us today and uh, Chimwemwe as well from uh, Akina Mamua Africa. So let me briefly take you through the agenda. Um, we have about 35 minutes for a discussion with our guest speakers. We have three fast guest speakers for you all today. Then we have about 10 minutes for a Q&A, so you can pose your questions to our speakers. There's gonna be a mentee form in the chat where you can submit your questions. And this was a conscious decision, not only because um, there's quite a lot of people in the room today, so to keep a kind of overview, but also so that people can submit questions anonymously. So we wanted to, yeah, just make it a bit more of a uh, accessible space for people to ask the questions they want to. Then we have about 15 minutes for breakout rooms. You'll be in uh, maximum groups of five, maybe a bit smaller. If you don't feel like joining a small group discussion today, then you don't have to. You can stay in the main room. You can turn off your camera and um, you can use the same prompts for the breakout room for a kind of self-reflection exercise. And the last 15 minutes, we will um, come back and people can share what they talked about in their breakout rooms. So that is the, the run of show for today. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, Sharon, could we go to the next slide, please? Because now it's my great pleasure to introduce our three speakers for today. So um, Hope Chigadu is a feminist activist with decades of experience in feminist movement building and leadership development. Over the years, she's had a focus on organizational development as well as the health and well-being of individuals as well as the collective. And she takes a holistic approach where people are the focus and their needs, emotions, and senses are supported and enhanced. And this is all described in the book, which perhaps some of you are familiar with, um, Strategies for Building Organizations with the Soul, co-authored with Rudo Chigadu. Hope is the co-founder of the Zimbabwe Women's Resource Center and Network, as well as Jazz Just Associates. And she served on the boards of Global Fund for Women, Urgent Action Fund Africa, the Global Fund for Community Foundation, and Oxfam South Africa. She now serves on the board of Practical Action, Thank you so much for being here today, Hope. Welcome. Um, our next speaker is Aruna Rao, a leading international thinker and practitioner on gender equality, feminist leadership, and organizational transformation. She is the co-founder and former executive director of Gender at Work, which is an international feminist network committed to building cultures of equality and inclusion in organizations and movements. Dr. Rao has 40 years of experience, particularly across Asia and Africa, bringing together advocacy and research. Um, on gender equality and development, especially gender transformative institutional change. And she's worked on multiple levels from the global advocacy level initiatives to international and national development organizations. She currently chairs the boards of Am International and the Noble Women's Initiative and is a professor of practice at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. And she co-hosts the Gender at Work podcast, Rethinking Feminist Transformational Strategies. Welcome, Aruna. Maya Tamayo, is co-founder of Angat Bayi, which means Uplift Women, and the founding and co-executive director of Bayi Inc. Angat Bayi works to eliminate barriers to women's entry into politics and enable the full and meaningful participation of women politicians and young women leaders in the Philippines. It has evolved into a nonprofit organization, Bayi Inc., which is fostering an ecosystem of feminist leaders at the subnational level. Maya also founded the Feminist Legal Network, which is a gathering of legal professionals and advocates working for more gender responsive, inclusive, and just practices within the Philippine justice system and legal community. Next to all that, so aside from being a passionate advocate for women's rights and the arts, Maya is also a feminist researcher and trainer. She was selected as part of the first cohort of the Women Together for a Better Normal program by Ashoka and the SP Global Foundation. That was in 2020, and in 2021 was a Vital Voices Engage Fellow. Uh, she's currently a fellow for the Global Governance Forum. And when she's not doing all of this work, she dances, travels, plays board games with her tribe, and enjoys coffee or wine with her coven. Welcome, Maya. So before we hear from these three fabulous feminist leaders, we actually first want to hear from you all. So Sharon, if we could go to the next slide, please. We're going to do a mentee poll. Um, so there should be a link in the chat for you to do that now. And the question is, terms, phrases, or feelings come to mind when you hear the word hierarchy? What springs up? Which associations do you have? 
So if you could all take a minute and follow the link in the chat to share that with us. Because we're going to do a word cloud, so it's going to visualize it quite nicely. Thanks for everyone sharing in the chat. Please make sure you also take a second and go over to Menti so we can create a beautiful word cloud together of all of your reactions. And we'll give everyone a moment for that. Okay, our word cloud is coming together. Wow. Power, patriarchy, domination. Those are some key words that keep coming up. Ladder, inequality, complexity, inevitable, struggle, exclusive, controlling, marginalization, lost opportunities, chain of command, trapped, static. Wow, 252 responses. Thank you so much. Okay, now I actually, as this keeps developing, I want to um, turn it over to our speakers. Uh, Hope, Aruna, Maya, what are you seeing here? What reactions do you have when you see these words emerging on your screen? Um, Hope, I see you right next to me, so why don't we start with your reaction? <laughs> uh, thanks for the beautiful introduction. Uh, what I see coming up is scary. It is tough that we will not transform our world. It's tough that does not create uh, um, an atmosphere where everyone can thrive. And my fear is that most of organizations are hierarchical. What about you, Arena? Sorry. Yes, um, again, thank you, Sophia, for the, the lovely introduction. Um, uh, I think uh, the words coming up around hierarchy are um, reflect, I think, many of our experiences of working in hierarchies. Um, and uh, and you know, power, oppression, patriarchy, inequality. Um, there, uh, you know, we ex expect to have to see that uh, in people's reactions. Um, I'm also. I was thinking as I was thinking about this seminar, um, this webinar earlier. I was thinking about how much women, gender activists, in hierarchies have actually been able to achieve over the last 50 years, despite all of this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that that's really telling about the power um, and the strategies, the feminist strategies that um, activists have used within bureaucracies and working with women's movements outside. Yeah, that's a beautiful point. Thank you. All hope is not lost, despite maybe what this word cloud um some emotions it also triggers in me of like ha huh. it's like you're right there there has been a lot accomplished despite this and that's something to celebrate um maya what do you what do you see what do you think when you look at all of these words yes um thank you so much sophie for the generous words earlier um yeah um same as aruna and hope um we see about we, we talk about power authority influence and we see this as what actually and oppression oppression domination shape inequalities and in, um, power dynamics so um we come together i think when we, when i see the word cloud um it's kind of um it is very distressing <laughs> but at the same time we i also find it that it unique that it's it's all because of this that we come together right now um we do our work um to challenge these hierarchies and you know advocate for sharing of power and the constructing power 
to a more just and inclusive um, community. So we hope we're going to talk more about that um, here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, I would actually like to come back to, to you, Aruna, for, for a moment. Um, you've worked in such a range of organizations around the world, um, as I just mentioned, and I'm curious, in your experience, what exactly are the sources of friction between feminist practices and hierarchical modes of organization? And is it inherent, that friction? Are they, you know, destined to be polar opposites? What do you think? Um, yes, thanks, Sophia. Um, you know, when you first uh, introduced this topic, um, you know, the feminism and and hierarchy, is it like oil and water? You know, I was thinking, um, uh, in fact, we're, we're describing two different kinds of things, right? Feminism is a political vision um, and hierarchy is a way of organizing, right? So, so the question for us is, um, you know, if we want to advance feminism, then um, really what are the ways in which we advance that and how does hierarchy uh, either prevent that or uh, in some ways actually enable feminist goals, right? Um, so it's really important to start with feminism. What do we mean by feminism? And it really is uh, that vision of gender equality, social justice and planetary thriving, right? that we apply in our organizations, in our communities, in our work with um, societies, and it's intersectional, right? And it's, and it's, and it, it, it changes, uh, it's meant to change and it challenge and change gender power relations and discriminatory practices, both formal and informal. So it's kind of good to start with that, you know, that that's really what we're talking about. And as you yourself said, um, Sophia, in your introduction, we've got about 50 odd years of research, right? Uh, feminist analysis um, that looks at um, dysfunctionalities of hierarchy and patriarchal values. I mean, um, you know, uh, Joan Acker in the 1980s talked about the gendered nature of organizations um, Kathy Ferguson talked about the feminist world. Well, her book was The Feminist Case Against Bureaucracy. Again, that was in the 80s. Um, Raywin Connell wrote about gender regimes. Um, Fiona Mackay and others talk about the importance of looking at the nested nature of organizations. You know, they're all organizations don't just come out of nowhere, right? They're nested in context. And so they reflect the values to some extent. Um, and ways of thinking and practices, cultural, that are some are discriminatory, some are not, of those societies, right? Um, and there is a stickiness to some of these rules. But we also know, and this is like, you know, if you remember, going way back to the 70s, um, Joe Freeman wrote about the, the, how the lack of structure can also be devastating, right? She wrote about the tyranny of structurelessness, right? So, so we need to think about, um, you know, what, what, what are we really looking at here? This dynamism between feminist values, feminist goals, feminist practices, and and ways of organizing. Um, and of course, much of what we we know from the analysis and the word cloud, right? Because people have experienced this are in fact those stickiness uh, you know, in hierarchical rules that make it very difficult to operate um, with feminist goals and with, um, with feminist practices. Um, but when we think about this you know, as a whole, um, we need to think about the context in which these organizations are operating, right? So if you're talking about trade unions in South Africa, for example, um, you need to think about not just what's happening within the organization, you need to think about what are the conditions that that shape people's entry within organizations, right? So if you have leadership meetings in trade unions held at night, the fact that in many of those communities, women also bear the responsibility for childcare and homework 
and cannot easily travel safely at night means that that restriction is there in terms of it's a it's not a formal restriction, but it's an informal restriction that limits participation, right? And then there's a piece of it that has to do with the organization itself, which again, we know a lot about. Um, how do feminist practices butt up against hierarchical ways of organizing uh, and ways of working? And then the other piece I think that we kind of maybe forget about is really what is the purpose of all of this, right? It's not it's not for, it's not simply to change practices for the purpose of changing practices. It is to change practices for the purpose of achieving goals, right? And what are these feminist goals? Often we work, and, and I include in myself in that, often we work in organizations which have goals that um, are not necessarily feminist or anti-colonial or transformative in any sort of way. Um, they may be in fact perpetuating uh, colonial relations. They may be, in fact, perpetuating um, exploitative relations. Um, and, uh, you know, they, for example, you know, talking about feminist foreign policies, it, we need to look at dilemmas within these kinds of goals and feminist goals, right? Um, so, so I think that's a good frame to be thinking about. And I think um, it's also helpful to, to acknowledge that um, hierarchies are not monoliths, right? There are holes in hierarchies all over the place. Otherwise, we would not have been able to achieve the kinds of things we've been able to achieve in the last uh, 50 years. Um, and, and the opposite is also true, you know, that, that um, uh, feminist feminists within hierarchies are not necessarily, and not just within hierarchies, are not necessarily good feminist allies, right? For various reasons, because it may come up, it may be at odds with their own personal uh, ambitions. Um, it may be that they wish to stand with institutional power or state power. Um, so, you know, it, it's, as we started out saying, it's complex, right? You started out saying it's complex. So then, then what we need to figure out is, um, you know, what leads to the abuse of power and how do we challenge that? How do we change it? And so here, um, I just want to uh, finish up by talking about um, uh, deep structures within organizations and deep structures, you know, what are they? They're you know, if we think of organizations as organic beings, right, um, that are influenced by their context, that are shaped by uh, models of organizations, um, then, then we need to look at what is it within the foundation of organizations, um, their culture, their values, the the um, the ways in which they work, the priorities that they they um, adopt the way power works in organizations and sources of power we know are many, right? They're informal, they're formal, they're positional, they're, um, you know, there's power under, there are many kinds of power that influence really how these organizations work, what they prioritize, who has a voice, what they end up achieving and who decides on these things. So in order to, whether we're looking at collectives, you know, that have relatively flat structures or we're looking at um, hierarchies. Um, and now, you know, we're now we're facing a situation where so many of us work remotely, right? So it is a gig economy where there is a, a an element of that observation, <laughs> Uh, you know, that observational power, thinking about Foucault, that doesn't exist anymore, right? You're, you're removed from this sort of space where you're observed. Um, so there are all these different combinations and different ways of organizing. But I think the important point is to look at what is it about those deep structures and the way, they're, the way they work? What influences them? And then how do we need to change them? So we need to think about leadership and capacities. We need to think about resources, who has them and how they're used. 
And we need to think about what are the formal processes and policies within organizations. Essentially, I've described the gender at work framework, how they react you know, and interact with each other to maintain or to shift um, these oppressive and abusive power relations. And I just want to end with, you know, Srilita um, Bartliwala has written a lot about um, feminist leadership. And one of the things that, uh, that I find very useful in Srilita's framing is the focus on individual power. Like even within all of these contexts, we, each of us have power. Uh, we each have individual power that is shaped by many factors. Um, and, and that power enables us to understand, uh, to strategize, and to be able to move forward, often in, in, you know, in ways that draw on both collective power and our own individual power to achieve uh, the kinds of goals we want to achieve. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Aruna. And the note that you ended on um, about this individual power, I also saw something in the word cloud uh, about power within. So I think there's some some participants thinking along the same lines um, as you. And yeah, your perspective, you know, bringing together, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at all of this research across uh, that's been done already in the feminist sector is super valuable. So thank you. excuse me, a slight tickle in my throat, uh, not opportune timing. Um, Maya, I actually wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, y'all. I wanted to uh, go to you next um, because Aruna was talking about, um, you know, changing practices and why do we change practices? It's to achieve goals and feminist goals. Excuse me. <laughs> Maya, I know you're also feeling a little under the weather today, so we're yeah, in it together. I thought you caught the virus. <laughs> um, but I think the frog has been um, expelled, so we're good now. But I wanted to come to you next because, yeah, as I said, Aruna was talking about changing practices. And I think many people in the room today are working in organizations that have perhaps been around for a long time. And then the question is, indeed, how do we change the structures? And I think that can feel like an uphill battle to a lot of people. And that is something we also want to touch on today, but um, I'm also super curious about your experience because you are in the unique position of having started, you know, relatively recently um, an organization. So you have this unique opportunity to not necessarily change practices, but rather establish which practices you want from the very beginning um, from this feminist lens. So I wondered if you could if you could talk a little bit um, about that, you know, as you've been building up uh, by Inc what has been your approach to dealing with hierarchy and setting up your organizational structure? Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, thank you also, Aruna, for setting the tone. Um, also, um, Batiwala is also our kind of, a, you know, uh, our guide in, in, uh, in Bayi Inc. and in all our modules in, in, in our fellowship program. So, um, it's not very it's not easy um because we have to uh, unlearn so many things no we we grew up we were socialized and conditioned um in the individual leadership style or this traditional structure um and you know um because by exists actually to challenge the current status quo, um, to create a more caring um, and just community, particularly in political spaces. Um, we, the group, the our organization um, has also to do a similar, you know, um, transformation within our organization. So uh, we are, as you've mentioned, we are really a baby organization. So we've been just incorporated in 2021. Um, I'm probably one of the oldest already in the organization. I've been with the women's movement for a, um, a, a longer than some, most of our um, um, members, team members who are really young, brilliant feminists. Um, so we, we, we kind of develop 
this seven Cs uh, of feminist governance. No, so um, I'm gonna share some of it tonight. So like um, the first one is critical. So when we look at you know all structures, all processes all relations within the organizations, in our modules, or even in partnerships, or dealing with communities. We look at power relations and structures. Um, I'd lo I love that Aruna mentioned about, you know, the, the particular uniqueness of, of Sri Latha Batiwala's work on focusing on individual power. Um, we want, of course, collective community power, enabling the community, empowering the community. But at the same time, it all starts from the self, you know, finding your power within. And then we, when we do that, we are able to actually share more power and empower other people. So um, even the smallest, you know, um, structure, process, or relationships that we have in the organization we are very mindful of who's the more powerful in terms of interaction in terms of identities in within the organization and outside the organization and when we are mindful and when one is mindful we always try to ensure that um you know more other people or other team members have more space and the space is safe and empowering. So um, that brings me to, you know, also what Aruna has mentioned in terms of the trade union. So when we do, when we do the, when we, when we create an empowering space, for example, and what we always include in the modules and in the organization also is that, um, when we do consultations, for example, this is one examples that we always use. Um, we try to invite, you know, women and to check on the projects, assess the projects, and tell and tell them about the projects that the community or the local government or the subnational government has to do. But we don't think about what time we we ask them we invite them over we don't think about the physical space um is it accessible to everyone we don't think about the space we're in um you know during consultations for example when when women come in and there's a higher position no higher officer like the mayor or the village chief who's who's probably even if they're not speaking their mere presence is actually very powerful to prevent them from speaking their voice. So these are the things that we 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 look at. We we ensure that this doesn't happen in a in a safe space when we do consultations. Um, second, when we talk about um, hierarchies, also in terms of uh, you know uh, we always think about you know we have visible invisible and hidden power so when we when we we do context when we do consult people uh we always think we all we are also mindful that when we enter community spaces or even in in our own organizations that they are the expert of their own journey and experiences so they should be able to locate their own solutions no so knowledge and solutions are not concentrated on experts or on certain individuals. Um, lastly, maybe I'd like to end with collective leadership. So recently we've, uh, we had like co three co-executive directors. We set up exploring different structures. Um, this is also part of unlearning the individual leader and putting the spotlight on community or collective leadership. So we come together um, and then we discuss things in a transparent manner uh, where, you know, where resources go, uh, what are the decisions, why budget are allocated on certain um, activities and not these activities. So at the same time, we create also collective accountability when we do collective, when it's more transparent. Maybe I'll end on this one, Sophie. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, yeah, I've had the privilege of, of seeing by Inc's um, seven C's of feminist governance. And I think it's great that, you know, you could share a few of those with everyone here today because yeah, the, the question of governance is even another, <laughs> you know, deeper level to, to everything that um, is also super important to, to think collectively about. So thanks so much for giving everyone a bit of a preview of those seven C's. 
um, hope I would love to turn to you, you know, I was also thinking about you because you were around, you were part of the setting up of Jazz Just Associates, which is an international feminist organization working on everything from women's leadership to grassroots movement building to cross movement work and is really known for very sharp analyses of power and trying to avoid building an organization that would be, you know, just another part of the nonprofit industrial complex, so to say. So, but at the same time, you know, you've worked with so many uh, different kinds of organizations and initiatives since then. So I'm, I have kind of a two part question for you, which is, do you remember anything from those early days of uh, those, those first conversations of setting up jazz and what y'all were thinking about at the time, but also since then, what other models of, of yeah, organizational structure have you seen that we could maybe also bring into this conversation? Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks, you know, for Aruna for uh, framing this conversation. I don't have to do that academic work because I'm really not one of you. <laughs> <laughs> My work is, as I've said, I'm a servant of feminists. I'm one of those raw chickens, road runners <laughs> that just works. And, you know, uh, what I find is what I find and what I work with. Uh, Rudo and I wrote the book that you mentioned earlier on, uh, Building Organizations or Developing Organizations with a Soul. We did it because of the work we have seen, because of the, the organizations we have visited. You visit an organization, it's a feminist organization, but there is no fire. It's not grounded. <laughs> People are so tired. They wake up, stand at the gate, and they say, should I go in or not? Or you find an organization, and it really looks like, just, you know, vegetables that have been in the sun, spinach for a very long time, they are tired. Or you find an organization that, you know, does not have spare time for building relationships, for ensuring that voices are heard. Those are some, but of course, there are many others that are so beautiful, otherwise would it be where we are? So I acknowledge that, you know, feminist organizations have gone very far with or without hierarchical structures. We have gotten to be where we are. Uh, young feminists might not know the struggle in the early, you know, years, but you know where we are because of the work that people have done. So when we started with jazz, we learned very much from traditional African societies. I'm not praising them. My sisters here from Africa will know how hierarchical they can be, how oppressive they can be. But if we go way, way, way back, you find that in most African societies, a chief was a chief, not because of power, but because a chief had the, the capacity to enable everyone or to create, um, to create an atmosphere where everyone could thrive, where everyone's talents were harvested. One, you know, you're a healer, your talents were used. You're a dancer, your talents were used. Yeah, you know, a domain, a domain was created where everyone's talents were harvested. Whatever you were, and I think that's how it was with jazz, that whoever you were, your talents were harvested. You didn't have to carry a party card. You didn't have to be, you know, to have a position in jazz. You just had to subscribe to the values, to the principles, and then you were just go. So that that is, you know, that is what is we borrowed from that traditional way of doing things. That Chiefs created, they were, you know, African societies were really hierarchical, but chiefs created domains in which everyone flourished, in which everyone knew they were wanted, in which everyone knew that, yeah, they are not dancers, but they are healers. They are not just healers. They are jesters. They are not just jesters. They are, they, 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 they know how to, 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 to grow crops. That's how it was. So it was like that for a long time in jazz, that 
really, you know, we, we thrived without um, having, having, you know, a, a, an organizational position in the organization. But of course, as jazz grew, there were demands from the funders. One, structure, there was a structure dilemma in the sense that they wanted to see structures, they wanted to see systems. So the question was already, so, you know, where does the buck stop? Where is your board? What happens, you know, when there is conflict? They demanded structure, you know, um, uh, uh, um, positions, which meant that we needed to create a structure with a governance board. We needed to have a director and you know everything that goes with that. And that really killed the spirit of collective organizing. We were doing okay, we were very happy. Everyone's talent we have said, and we knew, you know, who 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 had which talent. Some people, you know, would just dance. Others would sing. Others would, you know, um, motivate. Others were gestures. Others were facilitators. Others were organizers. But those are not um, job descriptions recognized by the funders. So there was that structure dilemma. And we were forced to create a board and create the usual, you know, uh, organizations. That doesn't mean the work stopped, but there was energy that went with that. Then the issue of managing conflict. In the past, you know, before we became very, you know, uh, very well organized, well organized as seen by the funders and the world, we had ways of managing conflict. If there was conflict, we had a group of elders that would sit and try and understand the cause of the conflict. We didn't shy away from conflict, but now we were forced to follow organizational structures. Oh, how does the board come into this? You know, the director, the program officers that killed that, you know, original way of managing conflict. And then issues of difference. At the beginning, we knew there were differences. We were working mostly with women uh, living with HIV and others. You know, there were all sorts of differences and we were aware of them. And the women, you know, who were affected took the lead. And some of them were not as well educated as the women you find in most international organizations. And that was okay. But when the funders came in, again, they started criticizing who was in the structure, you know, what are their qualifications, you know, who are they? And then, you know, we had the issue of political agenda in the sense that we came from different backgrounds, we came from different um, countries, we came, you know, there were all these differences that we, we, we understood, you know, in terms of diversity. But, you know, as time went on again, you know, um, it became very difficult. So in short, um, we started off with a, a framework and our framework was the traditional African societies where a chief creates a domain where everyone's talents, gifts, achievements are recognized and they bring that in the group Everyone knows that Hope is a healer and she's going to be called upon to support this group. Everyone knows Hope is a dancer and when we are unhappy, Hope is going to dance. <laughs> I can't even dance. Everyone knows that, you know, so-and-so is a musician and things are going to happen and they will sing. So our job descriptions were not, they combined a bit of what we had been trained for formally but they also combined a bit of what we were in real lives. You know how you are in an organization, you're a program officer and you have a job description. But back home, you are something else. You're a choir leader. You are the one who organizes people. You are a mobilizer. So we try to bring in that element. Yes, there are job descriptions, but who are you? Who are you? Who are you back home? What do you bring in? So that who are you, what do you bring in, was left out in the new structure because of demands for 
accountability, whatever that means for systems, for structures, and for, you know, creating a structure that funders, you know, uh, understood. So um, in my understanding, hierarchies are okay. They can be okay. But, you know, uh, the, the issues that my two colleagues have already talked about, how do we manage power in those hierarchies? Do we enable everyone to, the, the, to, to, to bring their to, to bring who they are in the working space beyond job descriptions? Do we create a domain where their talents are harvested? Do we enable them to, to, to go into their background where they have come from? Because most women really come from, you know, very difficult backgrounds, abused and whatever. And if we don't create an atmosphere where they can talk about their past experience, where they can talk about abuse, they will come in with that into the organization, what Shirata calls power under, where, you know, I was abused, therefore I must abuse. You know, so what happens when we get together in those hierarchies? Um, and then we have issues of governance boards, and that was key in the chairs. So we've got the board, but what does it do? The board is voluntary, staff is paid. What does that mean? The board has got other, you know, options, staff doesn't. How do they make decisions for us when they know they can make difficult decisions, go away and disappear, and we have to cope with the decisions they have made? That was another, you know, a critical issue. So to bring it all together, yeah, <laughs> to bring it all together, we, we looked at being in a hierarchical organization because it's demanded of us in a way, because even non-hierarchical, even non-hierarchical organization eventually, you know, form hierarchical organization. They are informal groups that, you know, create themselves and they hold power. So how do we, within hierarchical organization, create a situation, a domain, where everyone's talents are harvested, where we can bring our gifts and share them, where we can bring our talents, our professional expertise, our training, so that we are respected. The second point is within hierarchical structures, which seems, you know, really, you know, are here to stay in some ways. How do we ensure that we talk about power? How do we ensure that we are comfortable talking about conflict? Coming from situations where we fear talking about conflict, how do we talk about our past, where we've come from, the pain that we carry in our, in our bodies? How do we talk about it so that we don't bring it into our organizations? Yeah, we can bring it, but at least we have to be aware of it. How do we ensure that, you know, we don't start chewing one another just because there is no room, no space for us to talk about power differentials, for us to talk about our differences. How does that happen? And that, of course, the, brings in the element of well being. It brings the element of building relationships at work. It brings in the element of talking about power without shying from it, uh, uh, co resolving conflicts, and you know, ensuring that our different politics are put on the agenda because we come from different political backgrounds. So jazz, you know, is still vibrant, it's still interesting, but I think the original way of working has kind of changed. You know, they probably wouldn't agree with me, but I think it has changed because it was the only organization I knew where you could say that I'm a jazz girl, I'm a jazz woman, without, as I've said, carrying a card, without having, you know, uh, a, a, a title in the organization, but just knowing that we are buying into the values of the organization and that you believed in the work of the organization. Yeah. So let me stop mm. there. Thank you so much, Hope. Beautiful words that from looking at the chat, I think have definitely resonated with people in the room. And you touched on so many important themes that we haven't gotten to yet, like, you know, 
pressure from funders and how that can be limiting in terms of experimenting with different organizational structures. Um, hierarchy as being assumed as you know a solution to to conflict as if okay if you don't have hierarchy how will you deal with conflict as if there's not other ways or as if hierarchy can't cause conflict or repress maybe necessary conflicts and yeah I think the kind of prompt that you leave us with which is like um, what would it look like if we if form followed function if we want to allow everyone to show up as their full selves and really contribute the role the skills talents, whether that's dancing or something else, skills, talents, knowledge that they have as a person, um, what kind of structure would we build actually to, to enable that first and foremost? So thank you so much for that provocation. And I definitely have more questions for you all, but I know that um, other par participants in the room today have already been putting their questions in the Menti um, meter chat. So I would love to share some questions from the, from the crowd with you all actually. So um, Leila, can I call on you or Sharon to share a question to our speakers? Uh, yes, hi everyone. Uh, I've I've got three. Three are coming out strongly. There's some really provocative questions in there. Um, so maybe we can share um, the Mentimeter as a follow-up resource, so you can see, yeah, a little bit more about what people are asking. But one person is is saying. Listen, flat structures are a myth. How do you even hold people accountable in a flat structure? So some 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 kind of perhaps some cynicism there about um, what what's possible within a flatter organizational structure. Um, another person is asking for some advice. They're saying, what what are some practices to make a big institution less hierarchical? Um, and I presume uh, that's that's when it's it's very clear that the hierarchy isn't supporting what hope is speaking about. It's not supporting people to thrive. Perhaps it's producing more inequalities. Um, and then a final question, uh, in case people want to take notes or answer more than one at a time. Do you have any examples of hierarchical structures that limit abuses of power or have strong mechanisms to address them? So maybe that's a question about how do we build uh, a just hierarchy. How do we bring? How do we build a hierarchy along the principles of justice? So I'll leave it there. Happy to repeat any of them if that's helpful. Mm. Thanks so much, Leila. So yeah, Maya, Aruna, Hope. Um, maybe Maya, I would I would start with you. Does one of those questions? speak to you would you like to take yeah. on one of those um yeah i'll just take on the first one um um okay so to be transparent also um our country requires a hierarchical structure when we register right so um we have to have a structure we have to have hierarchies um so when we when i talk about when i earlier when i talk about you know, all the practices earlier, it was more of an internal agreement among ourselves. Um, even the co-leader executive leadership, it's not um, I mean, we we just explore that as a, a alternative structures re very recently. Um, so that's one. Um, second, when when we talk about um accountability, um for us, I think the very first thing that we um the basic thing that we you know ask for people who come into the organization is they share the values and principles of our organization um and from the start we we already during onboarding or you know interviews or invitations recruitment we already um basically ask them or we already let them know that this is how we work inside the organization so when they come in um it's a given already um second it's very difficult to balance <laughs> um you know if uh we have outputs we need we need deliverables etc and sometimes um it's not an ideal situation you know um so it is something in, in, in a situation where um, deliverables and outputs are not, you know, uh, are not delivered. Uh, 
we talk it among ourselves. So it's a case to case basis also. Um, so that's where we probably have accountability in a sense that um, we are we know that we have to do to deliver something um but at the same time we know that we have to take care of each other so um we value in in the organization we also value you know care and pleasure that we don't feel guilty when we actually uh experience when we actually take on vacation we actually take pleasure and care for each other so um and Probably one we were trying to develop right now, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, a grievance mechanism, um, because mm -hmm. even if we say we are feminists, I mean, uh, I think Hope mentioned earlier, no. Even if you say we are feminists, there are things sometimes things that you know in a in a in a, you know in um a, in a visible power or invisible power, um, uh, many of the team members in our organization might not be comfortable or safe to actually say their complaint. And I've seen it happen many times already. So someone who has the power or who has been longer in the organization should ensure that this space is available for everyone, um, even if they are, you know, old or, or, you know, the longest one in the organization or the newest one in the organization. So this is something that we want also to... Um, you know, we, we want to develop in the organization. And if, you know, if you have also um, experiences or, or systems already, I would love to hear from you also. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maya, for sharing that. Um, Aruna, were any of, did any of those questions stick out to you? And let us know if you need yeah. any repeated. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, they all did. Um, they're all really good questions. Um, you know, there's been some um, chat about uh, accountability. Um, and I mean, that's where that's it's a really tough nut accountability um, to hold people to account. Um, because often in, you know, if you look at large uh, organizations, um, say international NGOs, or even if you look at UN, you know, organizations, multilateral organizations, it's very difficult to sort of say who they are accountable to, you know, um, they don't seem really to be accountable to anybody. Um, and so, uh, so that that's a really tough one. But, um, you know, of course, we have made attempts, we meaning, you know, the larger activists, uh, academic uh, feminist community have made attempts at holding uh, some of these institutions to account. So one, uh, I think good example, you know, one can always poke holes in these things of how effective they are, but, you know, ICRW started a few years ago, uh, uh, a report card on the Secretary General's um, gender mainstreaming strategy, right? Um, it's, it's um, and they put it out now, I think for maybe five years. Uh, I don't remember how many years now it's running. Um, now, is the gender mainstreaming strategy not very transformational? Yes. Um, is the, you know, therefore the report card and what it actually tells us uh, limited by that? Yes. Nevertheless, it's it's an attempt to, um, to hold a very large system to account based on what it is they say they're going to do, right? Because most there are there are a lot of um standards and there are a lot of practices uh around uh you know um environmental standards or um social um safeguarding standards most of them are voluntary right so there's no there's no uh way really to hold these to account but that's that's an example at a macro level of holding a large institution to account. At a very micro level, the kind of social auditing, you know, that was pioneered by the organization MKSS in India, holding government servants to account for what for expenditures on um, local level uh, projects. That's another, that's a really good example of, you know, social auditing that then got picked up by a national program in India um, 
uh, on employment guarantee. So you know there are there are examples there there um, there you know they're not perfect, but I think that's that's a really good um, strategy. Um, I think the work recently on if you look at um, on anti-sexual harassment, abuse, um, and violence, you know what is called uh, euphemistically safeguarding in international organizations um, is 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 an attempt to also uh, be accountable for that kind of behavior, particularly since it's been so under you know the surface and not visible. Um, and there have been more, uh, you know, more, there's been a lot more attention being paid to that. Now, are they perfect? No. I mean, are they there and can be used? Yes. Um, do organizations take them seriously? You know, pretty, I think many international organizations do take that very seriously. Um, so those are, again, attempts to hold, you know, these kinds of structures to account. Um, I mean, you know, when you think about how do you shift power, how do you change within large hierarchical organizations? Um, again, there you know many sources you can turn to for good examples. Um, Raza Iben and Laura Turquette wrote about feminists in development organizations, and it was largely focused on uh, strategies that femocrats, right, feminist bureaucrats used within large organizations to make change happen, either policy change, um, particularly around and particularly around resources and access uh, for uh, women's rights. So, you know, insider outsider strategies uh, where insiders use the um, the political mobilization of a constituency outside the organization to to justify changes, policy changes within an organization, you know, that's a common strategy. Um, and you see that, you know, in, in many things, reframing things uh, in ways that become uh, political reframing in ways that become palatable to organizations. You know, if you think back to the, uh, the Security Council resolution on, um, you know, to stop sexual violence in uh, in in conflict, um, uh, it was originally framed as a human rights violation, right? Uh, Security Council said, uh, you know, we don't deal with human rights violations. It was reframed as a humanitarian issue, um, which garnered a lot of pushback from feminists for people like um, you know, Anne-Marie Goetz and others who are working within the system to try to make change happen. But that reframing allowed you know, that issue to have relevance within that context. And that led to that Security Council resolution uh, uh, to prevent sexual violence and conflict. Um, so you know, there are things like that. Um, and and you yeah. know, very important strategies, also interstitial strategies. So when we think about the work on um, LGBTQI issues, you know, how did they gain momentum? They often issues that um, that weren't on the mainstream gain momentum because they organize within these sort of the you know the cracks and crevices of institutional fault lines where there wasn't a lot of focus placed on them. So they were able to mobilize and strategize within those spaces and then bring it in opportune moments into the mainstream. Those are some thoughts. Thanks so much, Aruna. Um, yeah, I think I'm glad you mentioned the interstitial strategies. I think that's also something people can, can look up afterwards if they're interested to know more about that. That's a great resource. Um, and we're running just a little bit behind time, but Hope, of course, I also want to give you an opportunity to respond to any of the of the questions briefly. Um, did one of them yeah, spark a particular thought or memory or feeling in you that you'd like to share before we send our participants into small groups? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. So accountability. Uh, many years back, African feminists gathered in Zanzibar, uh, Zanzibar of Tanzania mainland. It's an island. 
and they had good intentions of creating a powerful movement that promotes African feminism on the continent. They thought they were of the same mind. They thought they shared values. They thought that, you know, the principles that inform feminism were clear. Within three days, they disagreed and started chewing one another. It was total chaos. Um, so it didn't end well. But from there, you know, after that, feminists came together again and they created what we know as the African Feminist Forum. And from the African Feminist Forum came the charter of African Feminist Principles. It's a very important charter, you know, people have used it. It needs to be refined, it needs to be supported, it needs to be upgraded, but it's there. So this charter has been used by organizations, including um, AMWA. AMWA, you know, AMWA, Chimwe from AMWA is here. And, you know, Chimwe, maybe you, you can, you know, share in the chat how you have used it. But the charter supports staff to link feminist principles and practice to taking action to bring about change. The charter acknowledges power and, and, and how to work to overcome power differentials, with, differentials within an organization, how to lead an organization that challenges systems and structures, how to lead an organization that challenges systems and structures, going back to what I was saying, creating a domain where staff can challenge systems and structures, advocate, you know, uh, for within the interests of feminism, and facilitate staff involvement in everything the organization does, including selection of board members. The chapter talks about providing a, a link between organizational layers and organizational structures. Because within organizations, there are layers, there are structures, but sometimes there is no link. We follow the mainstream of saying that staff cannot talk to the board, and it's only the ED who talks to the board. But really, who knows what the ED says to the board? The charter also is agreed on how we can work through transparent, how we can work transparently through the policies that we sign up to because the board creates policies, but sometimes, you know, our staff is not agreed. And if you look at some of those policies, they are so ridiculous. Like saying that, you know, if you break down as a woman, you are no longer considered fit to do your work. What if you break down because of a man in your life? What if you break down because of violence? What if you break down things that we take, you know, uh, for granted? So the chapter uh, looks at individual leadership and organizational leadership, even movement leadership. It's something that you can use in your own organizations, even if you are not from Africa, to initiate conversations. Within Akina, the charter is used for induction of staff. It's used to bring staff back when they stray, but also to ground, to ground, to ground within, you know, uh, organizational principles and values. Because sometimes we find that organizational principles and values have nothing to do with practices. You have values here, but the, the structure is not connected with the values at all. But the charter, you know, uh, brings back or connects values of the organization with the structure. So I know we, we are running out of time. I won't continue, but I just want to refer you to that, you know, Africa, uh, to the charter of African principles. I think it will be useful. We think that talking about values and principles once is enough, but it's not. We have to talk about this every now and again because we come from different backgrounds, different training, different cultures. And when we come together to form one culture in an organization, we need to have something that guides that guides us. And the charter, you know, guides us or could guide you. It guides many organizations that could guide you uh, if you choose to use it. 
So uh, there are many things I could say, but I'm very much aware that we are running out of time. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you so much. And if anyone is looking for it, the, the link to the African Feminist Charter has been shared by Sharon from Akina Mamala Africa in the chat. Mm -hmm. So thanks, thanks so much, Hope. And mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Sharon and Chumamwe for engaging in the chat. Um, I think we're going to send y'all into breakout room groups. So Sharon, actually, if you could share the slides again, um, that would be great. And we can go to slide six to share the prompt with everyone. Um, the breakout room groups are optional. Um, you can also just stay in the main room and you know maybe reflect on this prompt that we're putting in the chat um, yourself, do some journaling. Um, otherwise you have 12 minutes uh, in a breakout room group. So you should be getting a pop-up on your screen now. Um, so if you'd like to meet some of your peers and you know continue this conversation with all of the input from Aruna Maya and Hope, um, you can do that now by clicking the join button and we'll call you back in about 12 minutes. Thanks so much. Yeah. Hi, welcome back everybody. I know that was short and I know some people are gonna have to head out soon I see in the chat and yeah apologies for the technical difficulties but I do hope that you're all still able to connect with someone else and have at least a brief chat and exchange on these questions and yeah we have about five minutes for people to you know share what they were talking about in their breakout room group um yeah what came up for you and the person you were talking to what did you have in common what was different um or you know if you did an individual self-reflection please also feel free to share um, so yeah, you can just go ahead and um, raise your hand or come off mute. Yeah, Maureen, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you. Yes, you're pronouncing it correctly. Um, yeah, it was um, it was interesting, like juxtaposing both of our experiences, uh, me and my partner in the breakout room, because they are in a very large organization and I'm in a very small recent one. Um, but one thing we talked about is how do you mitigate um, what, what I've noticed in my organization is that when you take out the hierarchy from, from the structure, then there an, another hierarchy <laughs> happens organically, but from the privileges actually. So it, it, the demographics start playing a larger role since the structure is not you know, mitigating for that. So how, how, how do you navigate that, that the, the demographics start playing a larger role? in the dynamic. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. That's a good point. It's well put, as Karen is saying in the chat. Uh, who else would like to share something from their discussion or their reflection? It can also be just a question you're leaving with today. A new um, I can say something if you hear me. It's Carla from yes. Cuba. Yes. Hi, Carla, uh, <laughs> I was in break room 24. And I think that one thing that emerged at the end is um, that many of our uh, organizations are still depending on funds. And so even though we would like to be accountable to our peer feminists, to our project participants, Many times we are at the end obliged just to mirror the organizations that are funding us. So we come back to the very old question of where is power and who decides what we have to do and uh, to how our movement is still impacted by post-colonial dynamics. Um, and I was mentioning and I put it in chat, there's a recent book uh, from ECO that is mentioning responsible partnership. And I personally find it very strange that a donor is telling us how to build responsible partnership without asking us what it means. <laughs> and I think this was what emerged finally. Thank you, Carla, for, yeah, again, bringing in those various kind of contextualizing power dynamics, you know, colonialism, decolonialism, neocolonialism, but also, yeah, again, the, the funders. Um, thank you. Uh, any last thoughts? 
Ah, uh, yes, uh, Louisa. Um, I just wanted to share that from our um, breakout session, we had shared um, the fact that power sort of changes hands. Like we at our organization, we have an ED and then we have a leadership team that has equal power of four people, um, equal gender representation, and there are people that are in charge of different areas of the organization, like MND, finance, programs and resource mobilization on my part. And what we see is that sometimes we'll default to on certain decisions, um, a certain person, maybe because they've been in the organization for longer. And sometimes um, when it's something maybe that is more feminist thinking, it will sort of come more to me in the ED, but not necessarily because of power, but just because of more experience in um, feminist programming. So it just shows how the power sometimes, yes, can lay with someone, because of that specific decision, but it keeps changing hands. But also there was someone in our group that also shared that we need to look at hierarchy um, differently and how we can be power when it comes to um, knowledge, it can be power based on um, just how maybe someone handles teams. Like it's, we shouldn't take hierarchy or structure to be something that is so static, but how can we sort of create something that gives us a good blend of going beyond just the decision-making, but how we work and capitalize on each other's strengths. Absolutely, amazing. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that conversation. Thank you, Louisa, for sharing. Um, thank you everyone for, for sharing what you did and just being here and participating. Um, Sharon, if we could show the last slide of the presentation again before we close, that would be um, great, thank you. Um, so we are coming to a close now. However, wanted to spotlight that there are two more sessions in this series. The next one, you can already save the date. It's on Monday, the 9th of October, and it's going to be actually a bit of what we touched on already in terms of roles and how work is valued. We're going to talk about performance management and salaries. And then in November, collective care and well-being. So we'll share the registration links with you all when those are available. Um, thank you so much to our speakers, uh, Maya, Hope, and Aruna for their valuable input and insights. Thank you so much to everyone from the Akina Mamo Africa, We Are Feminist Leaders, and Fair Share Women Leaders team who helped out with all the technical stuff. And of course, thank you to our participants, to you all for, you know, giving us input to shape this series, but also for being here, um, for sharing your thoughts in the chat, in the mentee. Um, polls and the questions with each other in the breakout rooms and we really hope to see you again for the next ones and we'll also share a feedback link by email so please do take a moment to let us know what you thought so we can make the next one even better for you all um, so wishing you a lovely evening rest of your afternoon rest of your morning depending on where you are and yeah thanks so much again for being here <laughs>